This podcast is powered by Pivotal Moments Media. Check out our education, content, and more at PivotalMomentsMedia.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Life After the Military, a show completely focused on reversing the trend of veteran suicide, homelessness, and problematic transitions by helping veterans transition from military to civilian life and strengthening the mental fitness of our active duty military members, veterans, and their families. Our show is powered by Pivotal Moments Media, an organization on a mission to strengthen mental fitness worldwide for all. Go check them out at PivotalMomentsMedia.com to learn more. My name is Lee Elias, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Howie Cohen, and we are privileged to have Petty Officer First Class Michael Brown with us today. Mike served in the United States Navy for 10-plus years from May of 2010 to June of 2020 when he was medically retired, and he provided a network of infrastructure and satellite communication support while assigned to the Joint Communications Unit, which is part of the Joint Special Operations Command. In June of 2020, Mike joined the Intelligent Waves team to provide systems integration, solutions development, and product and emerging technology support, and currently performs as the Director of Products and Emerging Technologies. Love that title. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Welcome to Life After the Military. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. As I say, the pleasure is always ours. We get to hang out with some pretty cool people on this show. You're no exception. Uh, First question always, Mike. Again, you served in the Navy for 10 plus years. Share with our audience how you prepared and executed your transition and let us know what went well, what didn't go well. And if you could do it differently, what would you have done now knowing what you know today? So I wouldn't have transitioned during COVID. Uh, (laughs) Didn't have a whole lot that I could do with that. But unfortunately, my transition was very interesting for the fact that I had very distinct circumstances surrounding it. Uh, I obviously transitioned during COVID. Uh, my medical retirement. So with a medical retirement, you don't necessarily know exactly when you're getting out. It's just kind of a toss up. You send your package in and then maybe it's like, hey, you have two months. Oh. I'm like, okay. So uh, also had a baby during the same time. So Howie's very familiar with it. Uh, the lifestyle that we kind of live in the JSOC enterprise is very quick. It's very fast. You're always constantly on the move. Uh, so I had a baby and that kind of put the brakes a little bit where I was used to just running around and me and my wife are doing our own thing. It's like, well, now we have this uh, sandbag yeah. that we have to carry around. <laughs> Some very people lo- would call that life changing. Yeah. 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 Very, very lovable sandbag. Love them to death. Uh, but it's definitely interesting chase or change of life and change of pace with that. And then um, that kind of happened in September. Uh, I dropped my package from a medical retirement in November. And that's around the time that COVID kind of started popping up on the world stage. And it was like, hey, there's this thing going on in China. Not really sure what's going on with it. It's like, oh, okay. And, you know, a few more months go by and it starts getting more serious. And I believe it was February. I went to a conference and I got word that my medical retirement went through. And they're like, hey, you have until June to get out. So that, that left March, April, May. Uh, basically, it was three months and COVID hit. It was like everything full stop. Uh, don't come into work don't do X, Y, Z, like don't come into base. So I'm trying to get taps done. I'm trying to do all these things. And taps is like, we're not doing taps right now. We don't know how to digitally transition taps to this. So that was super fun to figure out. Uh, I actually ended up not going through taps just because of everything that was going on. It was like, Hey, we cannot facilitate you at this time just because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so that happened. So it was pretty interesting. Uh, but I kind of started prepping a long time ago with the intent that I was going to get out at some point. So what I personally did that I really think benefits veterans, especially guys that are coming out of the community, it's very inverse to have a social media presence because of the command and because of what you do, right? So my biggest words of advice for guys that are transitioning and are coming out of the community or not coming out of the community is just network. Um, You can have a LinkedIn profile without putting out all the sensitive details of everything that you're doing, but you can still build your network. Anytime you go to a show, anytime a vendor comes in, anytime you meet somebody, ask for their business card Um, because you never know that person. You know, me in this example, my first role outside was a systems engineer. I was not in a position to hire anybody. I was not in a management position. It was just, hey, come in, you know, hit the space bar, do what you do, and you're good to go. But looking at it now, two years later down the road, I'm in a managerial position where I have the intent and purpose to hire people. So network as much as you can, grab those business cards, because the expectation is that five to 10% of those people that you start networking with are going to be in a position potentially to hire, right? So you want to make those connections because your network is what's going to get you a job. 
um, I'm kind of leaning forward on some of the questions that you guys sent me, but you know, certifications, yes, yeah, certifications are very important. They're gonna open the doors, but really how you create and how you get those roles is by networking. Right. Create your network as big as you can. And then when you start transitioning, you start making those posts that, hey, I'm looking at transitioning. These are the types of roles that I'm looking for. You know, and you already have that network built and that exposure ahead of time. So you're already a leg up on the game. And that's really probably my biggest thing is just network as much as possible. Build relationships, talk to people, talk about their experiences, just learn as much as you can from individuals. Uh, one of the great things about being in the military is we get exposed to so many different perspectives and so many different walks of life and experiences. It's the same thing on the outside, especially when people are transitioning as well. My transition experience is not going to be the person that comes behind me's transition experience, whether it be because of life events, whether it be because of technological advancement, whatever it may be, you know, you need to talk to different people and understand their stuff and what they went through, uh, because something that helped me might not help somebody else, but, you know, person A might have gone through a different transition experience, and that relates more to my lifestyle and what I'm trying to do. Uh, so in a nutshell, just network, 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 build that out as much as possible. You don't necessarily have to have a picture on your LinkedIn page or any of these things or any written experience of what you do. Just create a LinkedIn page, keep it very ambiguous, and just network. And then when it comes time to transition, that's when you can take that next step and you can update it and you can, you know, put your blurb out there about, hey, these are my experiences. And then, you know, that way you're already set up. Yeah. Hey, Mike, I, I actually love some of the things you just said, and, and I want to kind of reinforce and pull the thread on a few of them. So what's interesting to me is obviously you didn't have a lot of time to prepare, but it, you, I thought I heard you say you were already kind of preparing for it anyway. I'm kind of curious what what was your motivation to kind of start to prepare even though is it just when you knew that you were going to going to medically retire at some point that is that when you started or, or did you already have like I, and I'll tell you why I asked this I, I, we had Brad Thomas on a, a month or so ago and it was very fascinating to me that that Brad would would had done what he did you know as a, as a Delta operator and never gave his full you know um, his full identity to the, to the, to the military, which I thought was fascinating. Um, and he did what he did extremely well, but he still retained a bit of himself regardless of what he was doing for the military. So I, I'm just kind of curious, did you always, did you, did you ever not expect to do a career in the military or, or did you just know that, Hey, at some point, everybody gets out. So I'm going to start doing what I can do to prepare myself for that, knowing eventually it's going to come. That, that's kind of what I'm curious about. So I knew the medical retirement was coming at some point, um, you know, did a lot of things in my career, uh, knew I had some medical issues, basically walked into the surgeon one day and was like, hey, I'm having these things, sent me for an MRI, came back in and the surgeon's like, so do you want to walk when you're older? And I'm like, I feel like this is a rhetorical question. Yes, I want to walk when I'm older. Um, so that kind of kickstarted it. But honestly, I was already kind of thinking about getting out as well, uh, just because of the fact, and this is a question that I pose to a lot of people when they're debating getting out or staying in, uh, is I asked them, what, are, what else are you trying to achieve in your career? Right. I was very blessed in my career as an ADIT. I did things that I never thought that I would find myself doing. Um, and literally, when I looked at my career, I was like, well, what more can I honestly do as an IT? You know, is there anything more that I want to get out of the military? And at the end of the day, the answer was no. There's really nothing more that I feel like I can, yes, I could contribute and I could mentor, but if I don't have the personal satisfaction and I'm not trying to work towards a goal, is it really? in the best interest of the Navy and myself to stay in. And at the end of the day, I arrived at, no, it's not. Um, so I kind of started thinking through that process and what that was gonna look like in terms of that. And then the medical retirement stuff kind of kicked up and it was like, well, this is the button for me to kind of hit the ejector seat and, and get out in a way that's beneficial for the family and everything as well, um, and also take care of myself, so. Yeah, so listen, a couple of things I wanna reinforce for our audience that, that Mike is, is sharing with us, I think is so absolutely critical. Number one, he owned the process, right? Mike, Mike took total responsibility for his, the outcomes that he wanted and started planning and preparing to, to deliver those outcomes. And it's, it's a really important message I wanna pass on to the audience. Um, and, and I'm going to say this, it may sound a little harsh, and I don't mean it to be harsh, I'm just going to be very candid and direct. You know, the, the military owes you nothing, 
All right? We give, and listen, I know many of us give your heart and soul and your family goes through a, a lot of challenges when you serve in the military. But the fact of the matter is the military doesn't owe you anything, right? And what you have to understand is that when you either are forced to get out or decide to get out, it's really important for you to take responsibility for your, your um, you, to plan, prepare, and execute your transition. Now, that doesn't mean that the military shouldn't be there to help you with that. I'm not saying that at all, but I think some people think it's just because they, des they, they serve, they, they, they are owed something. You're not owed anything, okay? You got a paycheck and you got other things and that's what the military owed you. Um, and you got experience and you got other things, but when it comes to your transition, you have to own it. You have to take responsibility for it. You have to be accountable yourself. Okay. Now, and that doesn't mean you don't ask for help. I'm not saying that either because you cannot do this by yourself and do it in a low stress, um, highly successful way. I, I won't say you can't, I would say it's the, the, the odds are highly against you to do it in a low stress, highly successful way without other people helping you. But you have to, you have to own the process. And, uh, and, and you did Mike. And I think, and I really, I really, really, um, uh, I think that's a, just a great example that you set for, um, and you took care of yourself and your family. And that's the most important thing, right? Cause here's the other thing, right? Once you decide that it, it, it's time to get out, then you really do need to focus on how do you take care of yourself and how do you take care of your family, right? That becomes the priority, right? Um, so, uh, so there's something else that I want to bring out too, Mike, that I think you did, you did well and, and, and I applaud you for it and that you, you recognize the value of LinkedIn. Um, and, and the number one, the, 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 the importance of networking, but LinkedIn enables you to network at scale. You cannot, and I did it very manually because ne uh, LinkedIn was only three years old when I got out. I didn't even know it existed, right? You're aging yourself, Howie. <laughs> I, I look, I'm, an old, I'm, an, I'm old, man. I, shit, I just went on Medicare, Mike. <laughs> Fuck, I'm old, man. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, but this is a really important point, especially for those of you who served in highly sensitive um, environments. And I know there's pressure to maintain, um, to not to not open up any kind of social media platforms. And I'm not advocating that at all. I actually don't think, I don't look at, at LinkedIn as a social media platform. It's a networking platform. Um, it's, a, it's a professional business platform. And I think there's a big difference between that and Facebook and TikTok and Instagram and, and all the other stuff that's out there that I don't even know is out there right now. But the fact that you recognize the value of LinkedIn and, 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 used it to your advantage is huge. And what I would offer to folks who are transitioning or not even transitioning, even when, I think it's important when you first get in the military, establish a LinkedIn profile and, 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 and start networking right away. Because whether you stay in for four years or you stay in for 34 years, that is what's going to help you have a very highly successful and a very low stress transition. And again, I applaud you, Mike, for doing all that, man. Yeah, it is. And, you know, LinkedIn is a tool and just as any other tool, right? How you use it depends on the outcome. Um, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but also being genuine. What I see a lot of people transition, uh, they start getting out and they get this anxiety and they're like, I have to post, I have to make all these posts. I have to generate this huge buzz around me. Right. But a lot of the posts that they're doing are not genuine and they're not themselves. Um, right. It is just very manufactured. Hey, this is what I think businesses want to see. They want to see ingenuity. They want to see innovation. They want to see this mindset and they try to force that. And it does not come off as genuine. Just be yourself. There's nothing wrong with taking your experiences in the military um, and transitioning those to a business mindset. But a lot of the times people are very literal in that transition and what they try to do. You know, one of the things that we really get out of the military is a very solid kind of program management and mentorship, uh, depending on where you are, especially guys that are coming out of the soft community. You know, generally, they market themselves as, yeah, I'm sort of kind of technical, you know, but I'm really good at leading people. I'm like, well, what does leading people mean? And they give me these really short blurbs about, well, I led in X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, let's extrapolate that a little bit. How did you lead? Were you in charge of budgeting? Were you in charge of, you know, uh, timelines? Were you in charge of meeting deliverables? Did you talk to anybody externally? 
Did you talk to the higher ups? Did you talk to down low? Did you transition those conversations and the things that you were being directed from higher subordinates down, or sorry, higher leaders down to your subordinates? Uh, so a lot of those things that that business speak, right? And trying to transition right. that, that's really where you need to reach out to guys that have gone through the transition and be like, hey, can you help me translate this, you know, stripped down, unclassified blurb of what I did into business speak and really kind of transition that into your LinkedIn and your, you know, your professional social media is kind of what we'll call it or networking tool uh, is a huge, huge benefit. So definitely reach out. Yeah. And, and Mike, I'll add on to that, that for, since we're talking about LinkedIn, like look, th there is a social aspect to it, but how he's right. It, it's a networking platform. Uh, it's a professional platform, obviously it is a online resume that you can continually update for anybody listening to this who doesn't know. Also the, I, the key feature for, for the, for the uh, purpose of this show is the, your ability to, to, to direct message people and communicate. I mean, LinkedIn, which is growing, you know, it's actually refreshing now when I get a, a non-spam message mm -hmm. on there, right? If it's, Hey, I just, I just left this base or I just retired and I don't know what to do. Can you help me? I, I look for those. <laughs> so, yeah. so, and, and you can have a conversation with somebody right there. You can have a cup of coffee with somebody online. Um, and you said it in the beginning of the show that, you know, 5% of these people you network with might be in a hiring position, but I'll say that all of the people you network with probably know somebody in a hiring position. So uh, that's really defining networking. Um, another thing I'll say too, is look, when I interview people just to give everybody an idea here from an employer standpoint, I've actually narrowed my interviews down to two questions. Uh, now they might expand beyond that, depending on how people answer those questions. But the two questions I ask are, how can we help you accomplish your goals? And what are your goals? And you better have an answer, right? Because I'm, I, nobody comes in here, in my opinion, thinking this is going to be the job for the rest of my life. I want to help you accomplish your goals. So you have to have one. And then the second question morphs a little bit, but I basically present a scenario where a person would have to work with other people. And I asked them, how would you tackle this situation? All right. And it can be, it can be very various questions of something silly. It could be something to deal with my work or an expertise, but what I'm looking for in that scenario is just someone who understands how to work with other people and wants to have fun with that process. Not so much getting the answer correct, but understanding, Hey, let, let's, let's enjoy working together. So if you really break that down, I'm looking for someone with a driven plan, a purpose, even if they don't know what that is fully, but something, their purpose could be, I don't know my purpose and I'm looking to find it. Just give me something tangible that I can, I can help you with. And then the other one is, hey, do you work well with other people? Because if you don't do either of those two things, at least for my company, it's probably not going to be a good fit, which is also okay, right? That if you're very introverted and you just want to look at a machine all day, there's nothing wrong with that kind of work, right? That's just not here. So for those of you transitioning, uh, you know, Look, finding a purpose, especially after 35, 40 years can be very hard, but, but purpose might be, I want to take care of my family, right? If someone came in here, I just want to take care of my wife and my kids uh, or my husband and my kids, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm all about that. Right. Yeah. And that's, so, yeah, that's a huge thing that I also preach to guys that are transitioning. And it's generally the first question I ask them is what kind of lifestyle do you want to live? Right. Right. Once you identify what lifestyle you want to live, that is when you have a ground truth or a foundation to find a job that fits that lifestyle, right? So if you're not trying to work or live a lifestyle and you're just going after and chasing jobs, you're not going to be happy. You know, figure out really what's going to make you and your family happy, what is going to give you the means to live the lifestyle that you want, and then pick a job based off of that. Because right. if you don't do that, you're going to be unhappy. You're going to be hopping jobs. You're just not going to find stability. Uh, so definitely just think about that first and foremost, too. What do I want to live? Where do I want to live? I don't have to get told I'm moving every three months. Is this right. really where I want to live? Do I want to live near family? You know, do I want to work remote? That's a big thing right now. And the flexibility that I had, I went from having to go into a windowless office every day, you know, on a compound to, all right, now I work upstairs in my house where my biggest commute is to walk up the stairs. Right. Right. You know, but it gives me that flexibility when my wife's like, Hey, I want to go see family. I'm like, okay, cool. Close the laptop, put it in a bag and we're off. And then I'm working, you know, wherever. So just right. think about all those things and what you want to do. Um, also, before I forget, LinkedIn does free premium for a year for military members that are getting out. Um, it is super key that you guys utilize that because it gives you the ability to creep on whoever's looking on your profile to <laughs> add them to do all those things. So normally what I tell people is about six months from you getting out, start your LinkedIn profile uh, premium. 
That way you have six months while you're transitioning, building up, but you can actually engage and you can start having those conversations with individuals. But it also gives you a little bit of leeway on that six months once you get out as well that, hey, I, excuse me, I can continue updating it. I can continue networking. I can continue doing all those things. Um, so that was really key to my transition as well as utilizing those free resources that that's are available. Point. And that's a great one. Yeah. And, and Mike, you know, you reminded me of something else too, you know, about how people post on LinkedIn when they're in the transition process and they kind of put pressure on themselves to, to build out their, their profile, to build out their audience. Um, you know, I, I kind of always go back to, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Quinn. We've had Michael as a guest on previously. Michael is a top, uh, a two-time uh, top LinkedIn voice, uh, will probably be many more times beyond twice. But one of the things Michael suggests is, you know, put some posts out there that just about you, about your family, about, because, you know, because his whole point is people need to see you as a person, not just as a, as a work machine. And, and they need to understand and, and see your character. They need to understand and see your personality. So he highly, highly encourages that as you post on LinkedIn, that you mix in very personal um, things that could be just about what you love to do, whether it's a, you know, it, it's whether you like to bike ride or you like to play music or, or whatever it is. So people can see the person behind the profile. And so that, that you, you just remind me of that. And I, I just share, this is advice coming from a, a, a top LinkedIn voice who will hold that position many, many more times and has, runs a very, very successful uh, veteran service organization that's helping folks in their transition process, so. No, and I definitely agree with that. I think one of the bigger problems facing uh, industries right now, whether it be federal industry or DOD contractors or commercial, right, is there's no culture anymore. The majority of culture is like, here's your resume, here it is. I'm gonna fit you into this slot because you fit this puzzle piece. You know, people are not meant to be puzzle pieces that you just pull off and pull in, right? The way that you get innovative teams and you get thought process and you build culture and you build momentum and you build all these things is by having interpersonal relationships and culture, you know? And a lot of that is so restricted. So yeah, those posts are great. Um, because it really lets me understand who you are as a person. It's not a facade. You know, one of my favorite questions to ask, especially during interviews, is what's your hobbies? What do you like to do? You know, I, if I turn off my computer at the end of the day, what is the first thing that I'm trying to go do to relax? Right. Because that tells me what your interests are. It also identifies potential information that you might not have on your resume. You know, back here, you guys can't see it because it's blurry, but I have a 3D printer, right? There's a ton of people that are really into 3D printing and creating and designing things. But, you know, as tech guys, it's like, I am a CCNA, you know, I work on network stuff. But in the meantime, I have the ability to 3D print, you know, minimum viable products and I'm into designing and I'm into innovation and I'm into all these things. But unless you ask those questions, you're never going to know that about somebody. Yeah, and sometimes people don't even know that about themselves. Like, like, I just had a conversation with a young man about that. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And he goes, well, it doesn't pay. I said, that's not what I asked. I asked you, what do you want to do? I, it's important to know these things. Like, I'll tell you right now, if you have a passion, you're probably going to have to work towards it. But I tell you what, it's a lot easier to go to work every day, even if you don't like your job per se, knowing, hey, this is fueling or paying for the next step towards my passion. And if you don't have that, it can get lost really quick. Make I want to bring up another point you just made up, and I bring this up, it seems like every episode. Um, if you served a, a day or 30 years, whatever it is, you were part of the greatest team on the planet. And that's impossible to replace, unfortunately. And, and you talk about the commercial sector, the private sector. Um, while I'm an advocate for companies learning to build culture, the truth is what you said, a lot of them do not understand that. Uh, it is something that's growing. It is a, a movement within companies of, to look at the person, not just the product. But you are coming, if you served in any branch, from the greatest team on the planet, the planet, there's no better team yeah. to not that team. So you have to prepare for that and also know that that's an asset in your pocket, that you are part of that team. Right. So you offer something there beyond your technical expertise or professional expertise to an organization. I would love, I love it when people come in and tell me, look, let me tell you why I'm a great team guy and why I love teams and love teamwork. I look for that. I mean, how he knows I thrive on that. Right. I, I will take somebody less experienced with that 
over somebody more experienced that has no concept of it. Yeah. And it's, I think a lot of that has to do with working together to solve problems in the military and how we can attest to this as well. I mean, before this, we talked about a change of command ceremony that we were both at that we didn't know we were actually both at, which you didn't see the silver I'm fox super didn't see him no, floating didn't through see the crowd. So, you know, it's, <laughs> It's interesting when you transition because when you're in, you know, you look to your left and your right and those are your brothers. Like I spent so much time with teammates, you know, and they really do become your family. But when you transition, it's definitely this weird thing where you kind of feel like you're hung out to dry because I don't have that left and that right guy that I've spent X amount of time with. It's all new. You know, uh, one of my coworkers and I were talking this morning about like, why do you guys have so much anxiety when you get out? You know, we feel it in these interviews when we're transitioning or interviewing military members. And I was like, well, you have to think. Military members that are transitioning, the last 20 or whatever period of their life, they haven't done interviews. Their interview is, I'm going to go to this website. I'm going to pick three places that I want to go. <laughs> and then I'm going to hear back that yeah. probably those three things that I pick, I'm yes. not going to any of them. Then you'll be volunteered where you're I'm going. going somewhere else. Yeah. So the whole interview process is very uncomfortable because they haven't done it. You know, the military is very rigid and it's easy to be successful because here's your right limit. Here's your left limit. You know, as long as you follow up right place, right time, right uniform, right equipment, nine times out of 10, you're pretty good to go. But so you're really stepping into the unknown, but getting back to my original point, there's just as big of a community on the outside as there is on the inside. And it takes a little bit to kind of figure that out, but it's also a strength of hiring military members and hiring veterans, right? We have these bona fides with other members that go to work to other companies where we're still talking and we're still engaging with all these different people. I have friends when I served in Japan that we still have a text message group with seven individuals to this day, every single day we're talking. You know, and some of them have gone to work for other companies uh, all over the place, but that's also business opportunities and business relationships that you would not normally have just because of the fact that you've hired veterans, right? Uh, I'll go to TechNet Augusta next month. I love going to the TechNet Augusta shows. I love going to any of the TechNets because it's a giant reunion. Of just all these people that I know that have gotten out and gone to these different things. So yes, you are losing the teammates in the military sense, but you're also gaining just a huge environment of uh, individuals. Howie, do you know Mike Mace? I don't, no. So, so Mike Mace, uh, we served same unit, never met the guy. He left before I got there, but I ended up running into him at a show. Um, and it was just one of those things was like, oh, you were, yeah, we worked at the same place. It's like instant best friends. So it's just one of those things where regardless of where you come from, if I knew you or not, you know, when I was active duty, just because we have similar experiences, it's like stepbrothers, did we just become best friends? Like, (laughs) yeah. So it just goes on with that. And it's really a great thing to see, you know, and everybody is so open. So for veterans that are transitioning, like, don't be afraid to reach out, create new connections. Yeah. I got to just add real quick to that and how we will jump to you is that you said, you know, they're to your left and to your right, and then they're not. Uh, it appears that they're not right. Yeah, they are there. Correct. They yeah. are there. It just you, they might be online or they might be in 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 other types of groups. Uh, and, and Mike, I'm not I'm not insinuating that you you weren't saying that. But actually, no, the, I, the veteran community is, clarification is great. <laughs> yeah, well, it, look, the veteran community is larger than the actual military community in yeah. a lot of ways. So so it, it just brings up a, another reoccurring point, Howie, that you are not alone, right? It, you will feel alone at times for sure. All right. That, that is a natural process of transition, but you are not alone. That, that is one of the most important things that we always need to say here. You do not have to go far to find someone that can assist you, support you, be there for you, for you to help. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that networking um, shows itself within the community, but it's so important to just remember you're, you're not alone. And that, that people have gone through this before and whatever you are feeling, there's a, almost a guarantee that someone else has been there before. Yeah. Um, and is willing to help you. And that, that's one of the things I love about the veteran community. Uh, and, and honestly, Howie, I'll throw this to you. Like, and you kind of said this, Mike, you know, the last 10 years um, with the tools that have been created are still somewhat in their infancy. Uh, it's, it's never been, I don't want to say easier, but more fruitful for a veteran or transitioning military person to find that network. No, it is. There's so many resources out there. Hire our heroes. Um, you know, Intelligent Waves has Warriors Ethos, which I went through. Uh, it's free, completely to veterans. They help you write your resumes. They've linked you up with right. mentors. You know, there are so many programs out there to assist veterans. So about definitely this? take advantage. Yeah. For you, Howie, it's never been easier to own your transition than now. 
Like I, I really feel for the guys that came before the internet. I guess there's, there's maybe, yeah. book, maybe books, maybe. Right. But it's never been easier to own your transition than today. I'd agree with that. I, I think what it comes down to though, um, and, and we've talked about this in other episodes and it's probably always, it, not probably, it, it's, it's going to always be worth um, reinforcing is, and, and we've kind of talked about this already here today, but when you're in uniform, you're part of a community, right? right. You're part of a tribe. And when you take the uniform off, um, I agree that people are there if you reach out to them. But the fact of the matter is the military isn't there, right? As soon as you take the uniform off, they're moving on. Right. Okay? So it's really incumbent on you to replace that military community with other communities. And this is a really, really important point I wanna emphasize here. It's incumbent on you to replace the military tribe, the military community with other communities. Now, it could be a veteran community. It could be a religious community. It could be a, an athletic community. It could, maybe you, you play a, 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 an instrument. It could be a musical focus. It may, you, maybe you're an artist. It doesn't matter what it is, but find one or several other communities to be a part of to replace the military community. The ones, the folks who have the biggest problem are the ones who their sole identity is completely, um, is completely focused on their time in uniform. And, and, they, and they don't know how to handle it when, when the uniform comes off, right? And the other thing, and you already mentioned this, Mike, but I'll, I'll, again, I think it's important to reinforce is the sense of purpose. When you're in uniform, you have a sense, and I don't care whether you're in a special ops community or you're in a conventional organization. I don't care if you're a logistician. I don't care if you're an infantryman. I don't give a shit what you do. You have a sense of purpose. And, um, and the, the thing is, when you come out of uniform, if you're not careful, you'll lose that sense of purpose. You now have to replace that with something else. Now, it could be your work. It could be your family. It could be, again, it could be part, maybe religious focus, whatever it is. Maybe you, you, you it's community-based. Uh, maybe you, you work with a charitable organization, right? But you, the point is you've got to replace that community and you've got to replace that sense of purpose, right? And the folks who don't, that's when the downward spiral starts. And that's the ones that we have to be really careful of and, and reach out and find them and help them, right? So um, now this is, this is great stuff, Mike. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just, I love the fact, again, that you, you, it's, you, you did all the right things, man. In spite of the fact that you had such a short period of time, technically a short period of time to transition out because you planned and prepared in some form or fashion, you know, it's, it looks like you landed relatively softly comparatively speaking. Yeah. I like, I have a phrase that I tell people, I call it falling upwards. Somehow my life always just seems to work out and I call it falling upwards. Um, I've been incredibly, you know, lucky to have, just amazing mentors. And I don't know if it's because I seek them out or I'm a problem child and people seek me out, but I've had, <laughs> I've had great mentors that have really helped me out along the way and really shaped, you know, who I've become today, including uh, Tony Crescenzo and John Haynes, you know, my current boss is Jared Shepard. Like all those guys really looked at me and been like, Hey, like you have potential, but what are you doing to actually achieve it? And asking those hard questions, you know, Lee really asked one of them, it's like, well, what are your goals? You know, I think uh, nobody is beyond reproach. I got asked that by Tony Crescenzo and he's like, well, what are your goals? What do you want to do? And I was dumbfounded. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, less than a year ago. I was like, man, I never really thought about what does Mike Brown want? You know, and I think there's a certain amount of honesty you have to have with yourself and ask yourself those hard questions and be prepared to answer them. Uh, you know, but also that comes a lot from transitioning and having you know, that's one of those questions that as we learn and as we grow and as we iterate and we mentor, those are things that we need to ask the people that come behind us. Uh, I really didn't feel comfortable assisting people transitioning up until about six months ago because I didn't think I had a good hold around it and I didn't feel like I had enough knowledge to really help somebody. Uh, and I kind of started doing it and I was like, you know what, like I, I do have some things to bring to the table. Um, so you know, my challenge to anybody that has transitioned or is going through transition is don't wait a year and a half to start helping those behind you, right? Figure out who's transitioning in the next six months to a year and just start talking to them. 
So that way they're learning those experiences in real time and they can apply them. You know, transition is a constant kind of shell game. Like I said before, the situation that I found myself in is very different than what people are finding themselves in now. But due to market trends, recession fears, and all these different things, my transition and the advice I'm giving may be outdated. But that's really when you need to go to somebody that has recently transitioned uh, and go to it or point people to those resources. Um, Chris Leon, great advocate, works at NetApp now. I was assisting him. We were talking to him a little bit. And that's one of those people that I was like, hey, would you mind talking to X, Y, and Z that's transitioning and kind of give them a heads up and make those introductions to people because they have more relative experience about transitioning. So yes, it's good to talk and transition, but really talk to somebody that's done it recently because they're going to have more real life applicable experience to it. Yeah. And I'm going to throw out another resource um, that I think is really important because I'm, I'm, I'm heavily, heavily in, in, involved with them is, and it's still very much in a pilot program right now, but the Army uh, ETS sponsorship program. And when I say Army, it's, it's obviously a misnomer because it, it really isn't limited just Army. But, and, and for those of you who are not familiar with ETS, it's an acronym for expiration of term of service. It's when you exit the military, right? Each service has their own term for that. The bottom line is in, in the military, most units that I've been in, probably you as well, Mike, you have a, a PCS sponsorship program, right? When someone is when someone is coming to your unit, you normally know six six to twelve months out, and you assign a sponsor to that that person to welcome them into the unit, to answer whatever questions they have, to help them um, plan and prepare their their move to to your location, to to integrate into the organization. So we're basically taking that same concept. And when someone gets out of the military um, within six to 12 months of when they actually exit, um, if they choose to, um, first of all, they, they enroll in this program where we can capture all their, you know, they do an intake, where we can capture all their data. Um, most importantly, when they're getting out and what community they're gonna to go to when they get out. And then if they elect to have a sponsor assigned to them, um, or like just say Howie Cohen is getting out in, uh, in July of 2023 and he's going to Prince William County, Virginia, which is where I live. Um, if I elect to have a sponsor assigned to me, um, they will, the program will find a sponsor in, in the county or the town that I'm going to. And that sponsor will contact me within six months of my exit from the military. And that sponsor is going to help me integrate into the community, right? So uh, that's another great um, organization that, uh, that is being tested and evaluated right now at Fort Hood with the entire third Corps. It's being tested in the U.S. Army Special Operations Command with uh, um, with three different brigade sized units right now. I've served in two of those units, the Ranger Regiment um, in a third special forces group and, and another organization up in uh, Northern Virginia. So uh, that's another thing that um, I'll, I offer to folks and, and don't be thrown by the name Army ETS Sponsorship Program. You, if, you're a, if you're a sailor, an airman, a Marine, a Coast Guardsman, it does not matter. You, Space everyone, Force. Yeah, Space Force. That's right. I keep forgetting about that. That's right. It's a whole nother freaking force. Yeah. Um, and what do they call? What do they call them now, man? Um, Guardians. Guardians, right? Guardians. Guardians. That's yeah. actually pretty cool, Lee. You, you. I'm sure you would have loved to have been in a. a space Every time I see, I hear Guardians. I think the Guardians of the Galaxy, and I just right. can't. I can't break the connection for whatever reason. Listen, that branch might have been created under turmoil, but I think it's the coolest logo. I think it's the coolest name. And uh, listen, it's cool the, until you look at their dress uniforms. Their dress that, uniforms well, hey, listen, in the year 2175, <laughs> when they save us from the impending alien attack, everyone's going to look at them as heroes. So it's just a matter of time. But no, I, I, they, they, I think outside the uniform, I think from a branding standpoint, they actually did a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, so, hey Mike, you, you've mentioned um, Tony Crescenzo. We actually had Tony as a guest, and, and we, all, we, we know that Tony's the CEO of Intelligent Waves, and, and you work for Intelligent Waves. I'd like to transition. How did you find Intelligent Waves? Um, what do you do there? And, and what have you learned from your time working at Intelligent Waves that you could, that I think would be beneficial for folks in our audience? So real quick, I want to circle back to DOD Skillbridge because there's a very significant perspective that I want to make sure gets out there. So DOD Skillbridge obviously gives you the ability to internship with a company. Um, people generally use it right now for a skill that they already have. 
if I'm an IT guy, I am going to go and I am going to learn IT in the way that commercial does it, AWS, HashiCorp, whoever, right? I want people to start thinking about it differently as well. DoD SkillBridge is an opportunity for you to go learn a new skill and see if you actually want to do something in that field. It's not just a, hey, I want to hone the skills I currently have. DoD SkillBridge is an opportunity for me as an IT guy to be like, you know what? This has always interested me. I want to go learn and see if I actually like doing this completely new skill that I have never done before, completely risk-free. I'm still getting paid. I still have my benefits. It's an opportunity for you to learn a new skill. So don't just think of DoD SkillBridge as, hey, I'm going to go home the skills I have. It's also an opportunity to learn something new that you've never done before and see if you like it. So take advantage of it from that perspective and that mindset as well. But getting back to your other question, which I now have half forgot. So if you get- <laughs> oh, no, How did you, you know, you, you're working for Tony at, at an intelligent yeah, okay. way. I'm kind of interested how you, how you found or how either intelligent ways found you, how you found them. What have you learned since you've been there? What, 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 what great advice and guidance and mentoring can you offer, offer to our audience based on what you're doing right now? So I found that opportunity through networking. Uh, obviously, guys that come out of the community were pretty tight knit. Um, I was already engaging with multiple companies probably six months out. Like, hey, I'm getting out. Um, I'm not sure on the timeline. My medical retirement should be dropping. And they're like, cool. This is kind of positions that we have open right now, but get back to us when you're about two or three months out. I'm like, okay, there's nothing wrong with that, with the understanding that when you transition, it's not a, hey, I know this guy, I can get a job here. It's a, I know this guy and there is an actual position that I can fill. Um, it's not always an equal sum game. It's not one plus one equals two. You know, there has to be that position open for you and the timing has to be right. So that's why really why you want to network and create as many opportunities as possible because one day there might be an opportunity open, but as we're seeing right now with the recession, a lot of companies are also closing down positions uh, and just kind of being a little bit more cautious about their expansions and whatever. So I networked really well. I knew uh, John Hames, I knew Jonah, some of the guys that already worked at the company. Um, I had a few job offers on the table, but really what I was looking for is somewhere where I could be innovative and there was upward growth and mobility. Um, so started working with them. I had a systems engineer position working on Hypori at one of the commands here on Fort Bragg. So started doing that at the same time. It was like, hey, this is a slow project. We're going to see if you can be of assistance anywhere else. Uh, so I started working with IWI, which falls underneath John's. It's Intelligent Waves Innovations Division. Uh, we started kind of looking at some of the products they had and how to automate and how to make them a little bit more efficient. So started kind of working with them. Uh, we brought deployment times down from like two weeks to sub day through that effort. Wow. Uh, so they were like, well, it seems like you're a better fit over here. So we moved over to that position. And then I kind of slowly started working my way up as I started taking on responsibility. Um, one of the, the gifts and the curses of coming from the soft community is we like solving problems. So when I see a problem, I'm like, oh, look, this is mine. And then I start trying to solve problems. So that has kind of launched me into this career trajectory that I currently have now of management and, you know, trying to solve a lot of the problems that we have. And really that's core to what I do at Intelligent Waves is, hey, what problems did I have when I was in that were super frustrating that nobody's solving? And we're trying to get after a lot of those problems and create solutions that benefit the guys that are still in the uniform. You know, as I said, I got medically retired. Uh, I was thinking about getting out anyway, because I really couldn't continue to benefit the military in the way that I wanted to, right? It's very hard to be innovative in the military. They're not just gonna be like, oh, you wanna try to do stuff? Well, here's you know X, Y, and Z dollars. And you have a better chance of doing that on the outside than in. So, you know, that's really kind of assisted me along and pushed me. Yeah, that's great. And, and, you know, you reminded me, I, I, I'd actually had forgotten about the fact that uh, about warrior ethos. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that a little bit, because, um, you know, Tony had mentioned that when we, when we interviewed him, I've talked, I've spoken to Tony several times. He's talked to me about that. In fact, Von Zell Maddox just, just got in touch with yep. me. Uh, Lee, you may not know this, but um, Von Zell, who we also was a previous guest of ours, um, is now the executive director of uh, Warrior Ethos. Oh, yeah. wow. That's, That's awesome. the, the, the veteran service organization that- No doubt due to his appearance on this show. You, you never know where this could be. I'm sure, right. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. we had a major impact in, in him. It's on his resume, appeared on this great show with the Colonel. 
That's yeah. that's how they do it. <laughs> but uh, um, and I'm I was ecstatic when Valenzuela reached out to me. But um, and I told him once he kind of gets his feet firmly planted on on the ground, we'd love to have him back and and talk more about the the program. Tony's mentioned several times, and if I if I have it right, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the actual um, the founder of Intelligent Waves is the one who mm-hmm. is financially backing Warrior Ethos, right? Who had and I, if I remember correctly from conversation with Tony, this individual never served, but is so focused on taking care of veterans. So he, he did serve. Oh, uh, he did. He, okay. Yeah, he was active duty Army. Um, did some time in Afghanistan and saw a lot of the technical problems. Jared Shepard, uh, absolutely oh, okay. phenomenal individual. Uh, we actually just were texting earlier this morning. But he saw a lot of the problems that were happening with different contracted companies in Afghanistan and the solutions that they were trying to employ just weren't effective and had some mentor- mentorship from uh, a few generals out there and was like, you know what, I'm going to go out and start my own company and really get after these issues that nobody is trying to fix. So got out, started Intelligent Waves, you know, got a few contracts here and there, really hit the ground running, started Spawning's company, and then also looked for, well, how do I give back? And Warriors Ethos is really a way to give back to transitioning veterans. As I said, it's uh, warriorsethos.org, completely free to sign up. They help with mentorship. Uh, John Hames is a mentor. There's a ton of other mentors that all come from either the community or externally that really kind of hold your hand, well, hold your hands around term. They lead and guide you. Uh, through the transition process, they assist with resume writing, they hook you up with mentors from other companies that are in either C-level positions or executive positions to, to really mentor you and try to figure out, hey, what is the best path for you, right? What can we do to assist you and help you? And it's all completely free of cost. So really awesome resource. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely, I'll bring Von, again, once Vonzel's ready, I'll bring Vonzel back on to, to educate uh, both myself, Lee, and our audience on Warrior Ethos. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Another I, great uh, name, by the way. Yeah, it is. It, it, and, and listen, anything that Tony Crescendo is involved with is going to be highly successful. The, the guy, he's one of the most incredible guys I, I've met in, in a long time. Um, he's just such a great guy. And, and look, Tony, I don't know if you know this, Mike. I mean, Tony is responsible for me, helping, helping me with my transition. Um, he was part of a company called the Achievements LLC, um, and and he and one of his partners um, uh, were actually consulting for the company I was working for. I had a very challenging transition, which was totally my fault. It wasn't the company's fault; it was completely my fault. But um, because they stood by me and, and supported me, they actually hired um, Tony and and his uh, and his uh, Ed Abner was his uh, colleague there. And Ed gave me, I mean, I met with Ed almost on a weekly, bi-weekly basis for three months. And he helped me kind of learn, you know, fill in the gaps about business principles and the government contracting process. And I was really struggling. And um, yeah, the government contracting uh, was one of the hurdles that I think the majority of people struggle with when they get out is really adapting to the the whole business cycle, right? My understanding of government acquisitions process was I take my form, I walk over to the acquisitions people, I drop it off and it shows up in the team room a week or two later. Yeah. That is not the case on the outside. So, you know, yes, it is challenging to learn, um, but I think it's harder to learn the relationship building and what really makes the military tick. So for those that are out there that are listening to this, Uh, in hiring positions, don't be afraid that a guy does not have the business experience, right? They have the knowledge, they have the bona fides, they have the the intellect, and the word is not coming to me right now what I'm trying to say. Um, They know how to talk to other people in the military and build those relationships, and it makes people feel comfortable. So just because somebody doesn't have the business experience, don't be afraid to hire them because of that. They can learn that. Anybody from the military is able to learn anything, especially guys that are coming out of the soft community. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And, and, and again, this was pressure I put on myself. It was not any pressure put on me by, my, by the, the, the folks, the leadership team of the folks who ran the company. In fact, they were very patient with me. And I remember when I was being interviewed, I said, hey, look, this is a tough business. This is hard. This government contracting is hard. It takes time to learn it. I was just so used to going into an organization and, and in my mind, fairly quickly 
providing some value. And I was working there eight, almost 10 months, and I was adding no value at all. And that was frustrating me. It was stressing me out um, because I just wasn't used to being in that kind of position before. I was demanding too much of myself. It wasn't them demanding it of me. It was me demanding it of myself. And, um, and thankfully, I, I was, it was a cultural uh, fit for me that they, uh, that that's why I chose them and they took care of me, you know, but anyway, getting back to Tony, Tony was one of the guys that was helping me and others in that transition process. And I just have so much respect for Tony. I do. I will, I will caution anybody that goes and talks to Tony though. You will, you will leave his office with probably six books to read and like three homework assignments. So if you're going to go talk to Tony, just, just be aware. You're going to have a reading list when you go out of it. Well, like the other thing is you don't talk to Tony. You'll listen to Tony, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's been great though. Like everything that he's given me is really just about stoking that internal dialogue and trying to figure out, you know, really what fits you. And I have a list of books I should probably post that he's given me to read, but I've also passed those on. And I've also, you know, given him stuff to read as far as just random stuff. And it's, it's been, it's been interesting. Yeah. Well, listen, and again, thank you so much for reminding me about warrior ethos. Cause, um, I definitely want to have Bonzel on, on the program and, and talk about talk about that. Hey, Lee, in the interest of time, uh, I don't. I, I actually would like to go to our last question. I, I think that's more important than the than the third one. Right. Um, and and so, if you don't mind, why, why don't we just go ahead and well, skip that up? Howie, you and, continually amaze me that before I ask the last question, I must do your favorite part of the show. Oh yes, yes. It's amazing yeah. to me after a thousand episodes that you have. Yeah. No, I'm I just get so I get so into the <laughs> interview, right? That I forget. Right. So, uh, well, you don't the, forget. The, I I don't forget. That's why I'm here. That's that's my my job, Mike. So for those of you that that's listen, why know this we have Lee here, man, because Howie screws is, it up all the time. No, he doesn't screw anything up. I, yeah, I, Howie, I'd follow you anywhere. Uh, but Mike, what he's talking about for those of you who listen to the show know this. Uh, every guest on the show. Uh, I create a book title throughout the course of an episode by listening to you. I come up with, if you were right to write a book, it's actually a nice transition because we're just talking about books. What would the title of your book be? Mike Brown. So I, I've, I've written a couple suggestions down here. All right. I take no royalties. These, these are yours. Um, there's two. I have two here. One was um, like, this is the one you said, but falling upwards, I thought was a pretty good title. That is an, that's a, right? yeah. I, I love that phrase. Right. Really. Falling upwards, how I found my place by doing nothing. Um, no, but falling upwards <laughs> is a good one for you. The other one, this is this is one of the more longer uh, creative ones that I've came up with, but but I think it's good. This is something you said earlier in the episode. It's, do you want to walk when you're older? A book of rhetorical questions you should ask yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. That's it. Just every page. You don't have to answer them. They're just the rhetorical. Like, you know, do you want to enjoy your transition? Just enough page. to make you think and make you right. feel uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. You're that, like, hey, is this actually a serious question? Or is yeah, this? That, it's an accountable book. And, and every page should have something like that. Yes, this is a serious question, but don't oh, answer. Lee, you always amazing. Yeah. Man. I'm going to say that one again. I love that you keep coming up with these, man. Do you want to walk when you're older? A book of rhetorical <laughs> questions you should ask yourself. <laughs> You know, awesome. I remember uh, it's it's funny that one that one with my father. How he knows my father. I oh, he's I was, awesome. I was playing. I'm a, I'm an extremely active ice hockey player in my whole life, and um, my cap hurt my back. And I'll never forget. He said to me, "This is way before I was even married." He goes, you know, "Listen, one day you're gonna have kids. Do you want to not be able to have a catch with your kid?" And I looked at him, and I was like, "I don't have it." He's like, "It's rhetorical." <laughs> but he was right. He was right. He was right. I got one good arm left. We're making it work. Anyway. Um, uh, Mike, you've been phenomenal, obviously, today. So, so the last question is that at Pivotal Moments Media, we seek to strengthen mental fitness worldwide. That's our mission across every channel that we have. Um, and it needs to be said, we all struggle with our own mental fitness at times and to varying degrees. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you're willing to share, uh, have you had any struggles with your own mental fitness? Have you seen others struggling with it? Uh, share what you do. Uh, share how you manage those situations and what do you do to strengthen your own mental fitness on a daily basis? Yeah, so I've, I've definitely struggled um, with a variety of things. Um, you know, I myself struggled with PTSD. Uh, I had a lot of events and things that happened to me during the course of my career that I really didn't notice the impact of it until, you know, ultimately it was too late where I was like, you know, I remember one distinct scenario, uh, me and my wife went up to Lowe's. This is like, probably two or three weeks after deployment. Um, 
and she was just joking around like putting the car in park putting it in reverse like you know just jolting forward and back and i got so mad and frustrated like right. i just wanted to go into lowe's like had something i wanted to get done you know and i realized after that it was like wow like why did i just freak out because my wife was trying to choke around at the parking lot like this is not normal this is not okay um so you know obviously uh I think mental health and PTS and TBIs are one of the kind of stigmas in the community, regardless of where you are, if it is the special operations community, or if you're just in the regular military, like you say that and people start looking at you weird. You know, so what's, what's wrong with you? Like, are you going to lose it? Are you going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, especially in today's atmosphere with all the gun violence and stuff like that, I think it's usually the first thing that people jump to It's like, Hey, is this dude going to have an outburst one day and just lose it? Um, so I really think, you know, we as a community, especially veterans coming out of the military, need to be open and honest about the conversation. You know, it goes into the whole transition talk as well. My experience is not going to be somebody else's experience. How I dealt with my situation is not going to be how somebody else successfully deals with that situation. But the fact that we can't have open and honest conversations about it is really inhibiting everything to do with it you know firefighters uh ems like all these different individuals all struggle with these different things doctors right now yeah especially one of the harder things to wrap your head around is everybody has different levels of resilience when it comes to mental health something that affects me is not going to affect somebody else but something that affects somebody else is not going to affect me you know it's really kind of understanding that perspective and coming to terms with the fact that everybody has different experiences and levels of resilience, you know, to first start having that conversation and come into it uh, non-subjectively, right, with an open mind. Uh, so kind of getting back to the original question was, yeah, I did, I did struggle with it. You know, I sought out resources to help. Uh, you know, there's still days today that I wake up and I'm like, man, you know, I know I dreamt about some weird stuff last night. I am just not in a good mood. But it's also informing those around you that, hey, like, I'm not in a good mood. I don't know why, but right. also just being open about it and communicating. You know, one of the biggest struggles I had was communicating the fact that, hey, like, I'm just going through something. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. I just don't feel good today. I'm just in a bad mood. Everything kind of sets me off. But communicating that to those around you really helps because then it's like, okay, like, well, now they know. So you know, they can be a little bit more careful in how they approach you. And I'm not saying they're putting kid gloves on and being like, okay, we're going to put you in a safe space. Right. It's just, it's right. understanding the fact that you're like, hey, something is just off today. I am not in a good mood. Uh, and it just kind of gives them like, hey, okay, well, if I react this way, I know it's not a nefarious, you know, he's trying to be mean to me. It's just a situation of what it is. Um, but, you know, getting involved and getting outside is definitely one of the bigger things that I like. Uh, me and my wife and our sons and dogs started doing weekly like walks right. so breaking up that schedule and that monotony and being like all right let's just go for a walk tonight after dinner let's get out let's get out of you know whatever let's just go for a walk let's enjoy the sunshine being outside um, you know definitely going and involving yourself in social activities with other individuals and friends uh, you know, obviously we kind of have a pride that we stick to. I have a lot of friends from the community still. Generally, we all hang out with each other just because we're a special breed and we all have the same type of humor. Uh, it's really funny, you know, who all the soft guys are and we're hanging out at a social event because we clump together in a group in the corner and we're all sitting there with beers making fun of each other. And everybody's like, I don't know, those people are vicious. They're insulting. And it's like, no, this is just how we are, <laughs> you know, but it's Mike, funny. a couple of things I want to mention about what you're saying, because I love that you have those groups. You know, one is you talked about that snapping in the parking lot. You know, one of the things that I tell people is that we have to not be judgmental over everybody's different breaking points. Uh, for example, I have a, a very close friend uh, with massive anxiety, and she had an issue crossing a street one time. All right? Like that's how severe it had a hold on her, but she did it. And I told her afterwards, like, wow, that was really brave of you. And I remember she looked at me like, I couldn't cross the street. I said, you felt fear and you conquered the fear. That's all that matters, right? Now, granted, you served in the military. You've seen things a little harder than crossing the street, but we shouldn't be judgmental on anybody. No, any you shouldn't experience. be. And, and everybody right. comes from different walks of life. And that really gets back right. to understanding different people's tolerance, right? When it right. comes to it, putting yourself in those shoes. And that's one of the lessons that I learned when I transitioned as well is, you know, 
we need to be able to understand people's perspectives and understand right. their intent and their relevance and why they're doing certain things without judgment right yeah if you right. if you take a step back and i look at somebody and be like well why the heck did they do that you know there's a few different ways you can look at it you can place all the blame on them which <laughs> is not healthy and i wouldn't recommend doing you look introspectively and be like what could i have done differently in that situation to proactively right right prevent this from happening in the future was it my fault is there some of the blame that i need to accept was it the guidance that i gave out was it you know x y and z but understanding things from other people's perspective really kind of opens up that aperture in understanding why they do certain things right. and once you understand why or even if you don't understand why ask them like hey why well, did you do this this way and, and there's nothing wrong with asking questions it's very accountable of you too like there's a great quote it's been featured in Ted Lasso a lot, which is be curious, not judgmental. Mm -hmm. And that approach you just talked about is curious. Hey, why did I react that way? How could I have reacted differently? That's where you find solutions. If you just put blame or, or judgment, like, look, look, one of the terms going around a lot, which I'm not against is like, hey, you're too soft. All right. But, but what does that really mean? Right. You know, and it, is that really fair in every situation? Soft to me is not the way you're describing this. I think that what you just described, which is being incredibly vulnerable, hey, I'm having a bad day today, and I don't know why, but I'm in a bad mood. To me, that's strength. That's, no, it, that's it, not soft. It definitely know? is. And yeah. I don't know if it's getting older, how he can probably attest to that, because he's a little bit older than both of us. But yeah, LinkedIn was only two or three years old when he retired. Yeah. I made sure everybody knew that. So, so. Uh, <laughs> having, having, that <laughs> having that introspective mindset uh, really helps in identifying those things. You know, one of my words of advice, especially with mental fitness is if you go through an event or you do something, be proactive about it. Don't right. wait until I am having these symptoms. I'm having this, you know, if you experience a traumatic event that you're like, man, like if you think about it for more than two or three days, go talk to somebody about it, especially yeah. in the military. Like I had a conversation with a Sergeant major and they're like, man, we are, we are doing all we can. I'm like, no, you're not. No, you're, you're not. not doing that. <laughs> You know, we provide all these resources and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, you provide those resources, but those are all, I have to go out and I have to utilize them. Right. Right. I mean, there's rarely, rarely a situation where anyone in any situation is doing all they can. I'm not saying it doesn't yeah. happen. It does happen. But, but just it's be proactive rare. about it. Right. Like being proactive, it just goes into the same thing. How he said before, be proactive and own your transition. It's the right. same thing in life. If you are proactive instead of reactive on these things, your outcome will be way better. Well, and if I may, look, look, you just said something that I need to bring up. You said if you've been through something, here's the truth. Every human on the planet has just been through something yeah. over the last two and a half years, whether you would like to admit that or not. Yeah. And the reason the you're the greatest social uh, social experiment of all time, right. what I'm kind of calling it, because it's right. just right. crazy. Whatever you want to think, you, we've all been through something. And it's funny because you talked about the parking lot, uh, snapping in the parking lot. I read this great thing, and it, it's, this was true of me. I'll be, my, I'll be vulnerable for a minute. I remember it was like a meme online, and it said, you know, you've been holding it together with your kids at home for two years, and then someone dropped the butter on the floor, and you lost your shit. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's like, you don't really, and this happened to me. Cause I remember like, like I was, I, I, my wife is a physician. She was going through it. Uh, you know, and the, what, what doctors are going through with that, which was horrible. And I realized around year two, like, Oh my, I, I'm like really on edge. And, and she asked me one time, are you okay? And I said, I'm not like, I'm something's really off. And yeah. it wasn't until that moment I realized, you know, I've like, like, to be fair, if you're a parent, you had your head down that whole pandemic, taking care of your kids, you did what you had to do. I'm not judging anyone. But uh, if you don't think that affected you in some way, you're, I mean, that's crazy to me. That The pandemic has affected everyone. Oh, it right? has. I mean, think about just a simple abstraction of that, right? Think about if you see somebody in a store wearing a mask. Right. That alone. The trigger. You're going to have something. You're either going to think, <laughs> oh, that person's being responsible or they're wearing a mask. You're going to be like, what the hell is that dude doing? Why is he wearing a mask? Right. You know, like there are so many effects that have happened that, you know, to this day, I don't think we're going to understand for 10, 20 years, um, which is crazy, but my yeah. son has never had a normal year of school, nor has my daughter. Like just to yeah. let that sink in my son's eight, my daughter's five, a normal year of school. And, and just to define normal, I mean, they just go and there's no, no, you know, constructs around it. They've never had one. So when my son had to go back to school, I, I had to explain some pretty normal behaviors. Well, what do I do with the other kids? When well, you, you have fun with them, you play with them. Never, it, it, they were isolated. Yeah. Right. So, so everyone, regardless of age, including your little sandbag, 
that you have carrying around. Yeah. <laughs> this, this affects Lo- lovable everyone. sandbag. Lovable, lovable sandbag. sandbag. L- listen, they eat, they eat, sleep, and poop at that age. That's that's all they do. That's like their their rotation. But the point is, is that look, there's nothing wrong. Uh, just to throw it back to you, Howie. There's nothing wrong with being vulnerable in these situations. With saying, "Hey, I'm not okay. It's okay to not be okay." And above all, uh, it is absolutely in in in, in Mikey Champion. This to, it's okay to ask for help. You don't have to do this alone. And, and nobody does it alone. And those of you that served know that better than anyone, right? Yeah. So just, just know that, that, that there's no judgment. It, I don't care if it's crossing the street or severe PTS, you are not alone, right? And there's someone out there that can help you. Yeah, hey, Lee, you actually just hit the point I was going to make, and thank you for doing that. Because um, I think that's the message I want to leave the audience with is whether it's, you know, planning, preparing, executing your transition, dealing with any kind of mental fitness challenges you're dealing with. It's really, really important. And and if if you get nothing else out of this episode, there's been absolute gold dropped this whole freaking episode. But if you get nothing out of this episode, know this, you are not alone. And it is not weakness. It is a sign of strength to ask for help. Again, whether it's help with your transition, to plan it, to prepare for it, to execute it, whether it's a, a, a mental fitness challenge you're dealing with, you know, you, you, look, we want to be resilient. We want to be able to face and overcome adversity. And I want to see that develop so much more in our society today than it is. But there are all of us, all of us, at some point need help from someone else and you should never fear asking for it so you should never fear asking for it you should also help out you know how we progress as a society and how we move forward as humanity as a species is helping those that come behind us right it's like exactly right Mike. building up your foxhole right in military never stop you know never settle for what it is like we constantly need to be assisting those behind us and helping them move forward that's the only way we move forward. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And, and that's exactly the point I was going to finish with. And if you see someone else who is struggling, right, sometimes all they need is just to know that someone cares. Right. They just need to know that they're not alone. You don't have to be a freaking clinical psychologist. You just have to be someone who cares enough about them to be there, be there for them in whatever way they need you to be there for them. And it might just be a, a shoulder to, to lean on or to cry on or, or someone to, that's going to listen to them, whatever it is. But when you see someone who's struggling, you know, be there for them. Let them know that they're not alone. And that could make a huge difference for all of us. And it doesn't matter whether you're a veteran, whether you're a, a teacher, a nurse, a, a school teacher, uh, um, you know, someone in school, you know, because things have changed so much, whatever it is you're doing, you know, um, you're not alone. And if you see someone who's struggling, just be there for them, man. Yeah, well, it is. And, you know, one of the things that I've really learned is sometimes people just want to vent, just be there to vent, just shut up, listen to them, nod your head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't agree with it, just eat it. You know, sometimes people want to vent and that's something you can ask them. Do you want to vent or do you want advice? Because sometimes people just need to vent and they want to get that off their shoulders. And then other time people seek advice. So, oh, Mike, have you been talking to my wife, man? Because uh, no. <laughs> I'm always trying to solve her problems. And all she wants to do is talk about them. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat with you, Howie. Sometimes I got to in my own mind, Lee, shut up. Just yeah. shut up for a minute. Listen, uh, um, listen, not to make a joke of it, Mike, that's actually fantastic advice. We always say that about it coaching uh sports coach well how do i get through to my players listen to them stop talking to them listen to them they could probably give you some pretty great advice on what you're doing well and what you're not doing well but um as a society you can't be just waiting for your turn to talk really listen to the person yeah, that you're speaking to it's really active listening with i which i struggle with and i still struggle with me too, with, me too. Know, i'm working a, on it that's what i say i'm working on it constant struggle because yeah. you know how he'll say something and i'm down seven different lines of thought in my head and i'm like i'm not actively listening and engaging in what's going on you know so really learning how to actively listen to somebody and be involved in the conversation past hey this is what i'm going to say next you know it's like a right and the active the listen 
the key is the intent. I always say that your intentions to get better. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. That's why I say, be curious, not judgmental. If I see someone struggling, but they're trying, that's what I notice. On. Same thing <laughs> when I'm playing hockey. Someone says, so, Hey, listen, I tried so to make gonna, this pass. That's you're going to love this. Yeah. So, so one of the things, and it's, it's not, not necessarily politically correct uh, by any means, but you know, sometimes it, we have to be real with each other and understanding the people that work underneath you and being able to have these conversations. But, you know, the PC version of it is improve a little bit every day, right? If I'm improving a little bit every single day, eventually I'm going to be in a pretty good spot, right? Uh, Tony's a big proponent of this as well. You know, we, we talk about this almost daily. It's like 8% of your work week should be progressing and improving on what you did this week. So you are more streamlined and more efficient the next week. Uh, the non-PC version of it that I like to use is suck a little bit less every single day. If I can suck less every single day, eventually like I'm not gonna suck anymore. Yeah. You know, but you you have you to get to that point. Yeah. yeah, just suck a little bit less every that's, day. That's great. And that's all you gotta that. do. <laughs> that's fantastic. Got another book title, man. Yeah, suck a little less. <laughs> suck a little less. And rhetorical questions for your life. Yep. Uh, Mike, you've been a great guest, man. You've, this was phenomenal as always. I uh, appreciate you being here today. No, of course. It was great to come on. I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day and having me on the show. Yeah. And, uh, go ahead, Howie. Yeah. And I just want, again, I just want to thank you as well, Mike. Um, it's, it's been a little bit of a long time coming, but I'm glad we finally uh, got, got ourselves together. And, uh, and listen, I, I, I hope that at some point we'll be working together uh, more in more venues like this as well. So, no, for sure. Looking forward to it. Cool. No, thank you so much for being here. And I think you have shared so much valuable information for our audience. Uh, we just got to make sure we keep building the audience that, that that's consuming it, man. But if they're listening, they're getting some great stuff here, man. Now I'm about it. And if there's anything I can ever do for anybody, you know, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, please message me. Like I have no issue helping out and assisting or at least pointing you in the right direction. Right. One of the biggest things that we struggle with is knowledge. If you keep it to yourself, does not benefit anybody, right? We need to be sharing knowledge. We need to be engaging in conversation. We need to be building this network out, you know, words without action and actually employing it is nothing. So if anybody ever needs anything, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I do have social media, although it's very limited just because I like to live my life, not just post it online. Um, but please reach out and I'll do what I can. If I don't have the answer, I guarantee somebody I know does, or I can at least point you in the right direction to make progress on it. Cool. You're awesome. I love that, Mike. Yeah, and, and listen, for those of you listening, take them up on that. You just put it out there, take them up on that, right? I also say this, if you're listening to this show, uh, you probably know you're not alone, but as how we alluded to, maybe somebody doesn't, share the show with them, right? Um, not to tell a story, but it, it was funny. We talked about, are we doing enough? I, I called Howie a few weeks ago. I said, you know what? I got this friend. He's about to transition. I haven't even reached out to him. I'm not doing enough. Can we get on a call with him? Right. Those are the little steps. And he appreciated it greatly. Right. Those are the little steps. You can never do enough. That, that should be the, the attitude. Right. So again, if you, if you're finding value in this show, make sure to share it with a friend. You can also rate us on Apple podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening, give us those five-star reviews. It really helps us get the show out there more. It doesn't just stroke our ego, maybe mine a little bit, but not how we, we want to get the show out there. All right. Uh, and again, you can learn more about our organization, Pivotal Moments Media at pivotalmomentsmedia.com. Take the time to check that out. We have a ton of other channels uh, dealing with adversity in sports, how inspirational women can inspire other women, building, building mental fitness in the workplace, um, how artists of all types can overcome adversity and strengthen their mental fitness. And of course, we have our Mental Fitness Education Center uh, with more inspirational, educational, and entertaining content. For Mike Brown and Howie Cohen, I'm Lee Elias. Thanks so much for joining us on Life After the Military. Keep an eye out for more episodes soon wherever podcasts can be heard. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody.